Justice, History, and Communications. Um, tonight we have a wonderful lineup, special guests. Um, my name is Neil Levesque, by the way, I forgot to mention that. And I run the Institute with a team of Kate, Lori, and where is she? Anne in the back. We have 70 student ambassadors who are all... <laughs> we have 70 student ambassadors who are sprinkled about tonight. They really run the Institute. Uh, we're very proud of their activities here. Um, New Hampshire is a special place. I hope that that comes out tonight. Um, it's more like a family here, and um, exemplified by that is our moderator tonight, Tom Rath. Tom is the founder of the Rath Pelly Law Firm up in Concord, New Hampshire. Um, he has advised many presidential, Senate, gubernatorial campaigns. We also call him page 89 because he is on page 89 of your book. <laughs> He'll point that out, too, in the middle of it. Um, we're pleased tonight, too, to have John Heilman. Um, John is the National Affairs Editor for New York Magazine. He's also a regular on Morning Joe. I know we all know that. And he serves as a political analyst for MSNBC. He's written several books, many, many articles. Um, and also, a man who really doesn't need an introduction for this crowd, Mark Halperin. Mark is a great friend not only to this institute and to New Hampshire, but he is a great friend to the students of St. Anselm College. When he comes up, which is frequently, he spends a lot of time with our students, and they love it. Um, he has also probably spoken more times at our Politics and Eggs series than any other speaker. I know that he likes that. Yeah, what do you mean by problem? <laughs> <laughs> so tonight, just a couple housekeeping things, obviously, if you're a reporter and you have your phone tweeting in the back, that's okay, but if you're not a reporter, please shut your phone off. Um, when we do Q&A, make sure you come to the microphones that we set up. Um, that's because there's television here and they pick it up. And the third thing is afterwards, we'll be selling books and they'll be signing them, so please hold off for that. Ladies and gentlemen, two authors, Tom. Thank you. Director Lebeck, he always do what he asks us to do with these treasured invitations. Uh, we're delighted to be here. President Salvo, thank you for having us. Uh, I echo, I love to come here because it's an earmark that made good. <laughs> I'd like to see more of them. But, uh, but, uh, and we are all in Selmians tonight because of what, how important this is to uh, the body politic in our state. And, uh, You've know, asked me a couple times, I'll say, yeah, I had a little work done on my hand yesterday, so I got a little excuse not to wear a tie, but really, I wanted to win the Lou Del Sandro look like. <laughs> <laughs> um, we want to put a little framework to this and get the discussion going and then uh, do your questions. Um, I was trying to think the other day, I, I decided that, uh, and again, I'm just a medical a Catholic school. Uh, <clears throat> Caesar wrote, Omnia Gallia divisa est in party strikes. All balls divided into three parts. That was the yeah. first campaign book. But a lot of campaign books since then. Um, one that I'm sure you read, if you haven't read it, that maybe you want to do some of the things that you have a chance to do, the Teddy White books, 64, 68, 72. And then there always was a book that they called the Newsweek book which is sort of the model these guys use in that they talk to people during the campaign that the, the tapes or the interviews are kept in a hermetically sealed envelope and nobody can see them and you can't use them in the press uh, until after it's over. And then they would write a book, and I remember Tom DeFrank used to do it. And you get the book out probably six, eight weeks after the campaign. Uh, Jack Javon and Jules Whitgover did a bunch, and it all came at different times, and I know where Art Park our mutual friend, the great friend of the Institute, Dan <coughs> But I think the state of the art of the campaign books uh, in the last two cycles, at least, have been game change and uh, double down. And these two fellows who are um, highly irreverent and uh, 
border, borderline perspective that really changed in the literature <laughs> and how we go about talking about it. And I went to just a little bit of process because it's a little different about how you do it. And I'll start reading one of you. Uh, identifying people who are willing to talk and sort of setting the ground rules. I'm not sure everybody's aware of how that works. Uh, because, because obviously one of the reasons it's successful is that people will play by those ground rules and you, and you break by those ground rules. Um, thank you, Tom, for doing this, and thanks to the Institute for having us as present. Thank you, uh, and Neil and the staff. You know, uh, we both love coming to New Hampshire. We've both been doing it throughout our careers, and uh, it's been incredible to watch the Institute grow to what it's become, uh, and the school obviously plays such a huge part every four years, not just hosting debates, but having candidates in it, and it's, it's always an honor when we're asked to come speak in a room in which we've covered a lot of news events. And to, and to be part of it, you all are nice to come out uh, this evening. Uh, you know, uh, John and I have covered politics for a long time, uh, and when we came up with the idea of doing the first book, which really the template for that was the, the, that book was sort of the template for this one, uh, we had in mind in the very first conversation we had doing it exactly what uh, we ended up executing, which was to try to. Uh, tell the tell the story from the point of view as much as possible. Uh, the human story is a story about the relationships between candidates and their families and the people who work on campaigns. Not so much about process, tactics, and strategy. And to try to answer the big unanswered questions uh, in the race uh, that aren't answered in real time. And the way to do that, we felt, was to do a lot of interviews. So for this book, we did 500 interviews. Almost all of them long interviews, a couple hours at least, and um, uh, and interviewed people repeatedly, which isn't done very often in journalism anymore these days. And to um, to really focus on uh, finding the things in the in the race that are interesting, that are emotional, dramatic, funny, uh, and we tell people that well, everything for the book is after the election. It's not uh, it's not for um, it's not for use in our daily journalism or on TV. And um, and that produces a level of cooperation that is unusual in its depth because again of the length of the interviews. And also, um, we tell people the interviews are on deep background, which for us means we're not going to identify who the source is. That uh, again produces a level of candor and an openness and a, a sort of a relaxed process that produces interesting stories that again. <coughs> going to be told in another form. It'd be great if people would tell the same stories on the record, but that just typically does not happen. John, the, uh, there's some criticism once in a while that people who, we talked about the uh, green room, people who clearly have been interviewed sometimes say, how dare anybody ever tell these people these kinds of stories, even though they've told them themselves. How, how does that work with you guys, and how have you been able to work your way through that kind of uh, uh, talking out of both sides of their mouths? Well, um, um, first of all, uh, I want to say also thank you uh, everyone for coming out tonight. Um, before I answer your question, Tom, you've done an incredible job here. I, I have many, many virtues. Brevity is not one of them. Incredible <laughs> <laughs> blank for that first question. Um, we've been across the country I'm doing uh, stuff since this book came out about a month and a half ago. We've been uh, to Seattle and San Francisco and Los Angeles and Austin and Chicago and Atlanta and all over the country. And I, I, I can't imagine a place we'd rather be um, tonight than here. That we love New Hampshire more than any other place in the country. <laughs> and I, I swear to God, I've never said that to any place else. <laughs> In this case, I think it actually might be true. <laughs> um, you know, uh, Tom, people sometimes in politics talk out of both sides of their mouth. It's not a phenomenon with which we are totally unfamiliar as a general matter. Um, and it's fine. You know, what we found in the last, in doing Drew about these books, for the reasons that Mark said, you know, is that people have been very cooperative in, in both cases. People often ask us about, oh, you know, how, how do you get all these interviews? You know, we go and ask, and we're uh, very um, respectful of people's time, and we do our homework, and we you know, go to people and say, uh, we don't want to sit with you, but we know we're going to ask you for a lot of time. We're not going to do a 10 minute interview or a 20 minute interview. We're going to sit down with you for at least an hour. In some cases, these interviews are stretched out for two or three or four or five hours. We had an interview, a series of interviews for this last book with, with one source that took place over three days, and we did the, the equivalent of 15 or 16 hours of interviews over the course of three days. And it's funny, it seems like it would be an imposition, but in truth, most people actually appreciate it because what they get a sense is that we're trying to understand 
not just, we're not trying to do this in a quick hit way. We're trying to get a sense of what really happened and, and to capture the nuance of it. And we're very, I've been very focused in our whole, the whole of our careers with being, um, trying to be fair and trying to be accurate, but also trying to capture what it feels like to be inside one of these campaigns. And so the great thing about doing these books is that we're writing for an audience that's not just political junkies. And so a lot of people will come up to us and say, well, I don't really read political books, but I really liked your book. And that's very satisfying to us. And we have a lot, we get a lot of that. But we also get stuff from insiders who come up and say, you know, this book, whether it was Game Change or Double Down, that really made, that you captured what it felt like to be in that room. It, it, what it felt like when we were having that crisis. What it felt like we were having when we were having that moment of triumph. And that was also hugely satisfying to us because one of the things we try to do with these interviews is, is elicit from people a sense of, you know, not just a lot of incredibly minute detail, who said what, you know, we'll talk to every single person at a meeting, every single person on a phone call, but we also want to get a sense of the feeling of it. Right. And, and we're trying to capture, as Mark said, the high human drama, but that emotional sense, because campaigns are very emotional, but for the, 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 it could be the most uh, exhilarating and also the most devastating things for a lot of people in their professional careers. And I think, in general, the, way, the reason that people, in general, in journalism, people want to talk to us because people have a natural human impulse to tell their stories. In these cases, it's just amplified by the fact that these experiences are so intense, and everyone who's involved feels as though they're doing something historic. Whether their campaign won or lost, they felt as though they're part of history, and they feel like they want to see that history captured in all of its fullness on the page, and, and they're very willing, and we're really, gra we're really grateful to them, but they're really willing to give their time and, and, and share their stories with us. How many have read the book? And how many are going to buy it tonight? <laughs> how many uh, see it as an ideal holiday gift? <laughs> <laughs> And that game change. How many of you have read Game Change? Same movie. Okay. So you yeah, if, you like, if you like the movie better than the book, just keep it to yourself. Yeah. <laughs> so again, how many have already read Double Down? Yes. So if you have read it, you probably want to stay late and not give away the ending. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> just focus on it. The, um, the point that John made about um, capturing what it's like to be part of it. On the inside, I mean, and I, I've done it for a long time since the calf uh, relay. But the um, <laughs> that sense of what it's like to be in those rooms is that something you find people understand and get? I mean, I know that people who are in those rooms really get it, but is, is that something that you feel you're teaching people about, about that really incredible crush that you go through when you read one of these things? Yeah, the readers? Yeah. Well, Mr. Page 89. The, <laughs> The number one in your heart. You know, I mean, I think so. And I think one of the one of the things about the movie that was so rewarding to work with the people at HBO on is they have the same interest. And there's a lot of nuance in the film. And you know, different medium, you can do, you can do different things in some ways, more powerful things. But but it, it's it's not always easy to convey that. Um, but we do try to. And I think I, I know John agrees with this. But one of the things we are most proud of is that we do we do. Uh, by talking to people in detail, as John said, everybody in a meeting in, in, in an important event scenes, same people repeatedly, to try to tease out tone and, and, and detail that does try to capture that. And, and that's not, not always easy to do, but we, when we find a scene that we, we think is important, there's a scene in the book involving the president on the eve of the second debate with Governor Romney in which uh, he has quite a dramatic moment uh, where he expresses doubt that he can do better in the second debate than he did in the first debate. We knew when we first got on to that, that meeting, which had never been reported before, that that was going to be not just a good scene for us, but historically important. And so to capture not just what was said in the meeting, but the feel in the room was really important. And we spent a lot of time on that. I think it's, it's educational and it's history, but it also, you know, it's compelling if you can get it right. There's a scene uh, that you described getting to that point uh, in the uh, in uh, Double Down, in which we're in that period between the you know, when the nominations been won and we get to the convention, and it's hard to believe in the, in our Romney campaign that you run out of money. And there's a lot of technical reasons how that happens. Usually, you spend too much of it, but the fact is, that <laughs> <laughs> they run out of money. In very New England attitude. <laughs> you are who you are. They, 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 you describe a scene up at the, the Romney's house in, in Wilfrid. Maybe you want to just walk us through that, where a group of people sit down and basically say to them, "We need twenty million dollars." And and I thought the 
depiction of that. I wasn't at that scene, but uh, somehow you got past page eighty nine. I was working fast. Skipping forward, looking at the index. I mean, how do you get that kind of scene? I mean, I know who the people were at that meeting. Yeah. I've seen them. I know how the, the dynamics of that. I mean, that really is the flavor. And it's not just a tactical decision. It's a person saying, "Yeah, I'll sign the note." And I mean, talk a little bit about that. Well, it's a, it's a, it was an important moment. I mean, one of the things I think people, um, one of the great mysteries of the campaign, and I, I would say it's a mystery even to people who covered it, was how it could be in the period of the summer when uh, Governor Romney's campaign and the Republican National Committee were both raising extraordinary amounts of money, and were they, every month the fundraising numbers would come out and they'd be enormous. And you would think, and in many cases, some cases, they were higher than what was being raised on the Democratic side. And people were, were still were thought, well, the, the Romney campaign is well, very well armed against the Obama campaign. And yet, people inside the Romney campaign were seeing Governor Romney get outspent three, four, five to one in certain markets on in terms of television advertising. And a lot of people who, even in our business, don't understand the reasons for that and why it was that the money that was being raised by the Romney campaign was for the general election. Therefore, could not be spent technically until after Governor Romney became the nominee at the convention. And so there was this weird moment where all this money was pouring in, but it wasn't money you could spend in June and July and August. And so this moment comes uh, over the July 4th holiday weekend, where a number of Governor Romney's senior advisors have to go to him and basically say, you know, we have to figure out a way to get bare air cover. We're getting destroyed on television, and we need to get there. And there's a possibility. We figured out a way to move some money around that's legal, but it's tricky. And there's a possibility that when we get this line of credit that we're going we're to secure, that you might personally have to guarantee it. As you know, Tom, Governor Romney, had spent a lot of his own money in 2008 and was very committed to not spending any of his own money in 2012. And yet, in this case, he was being asked to sign a document where in the worst case scenario, he might actually have to write a $20 million personal check. And so, as you can imagine, even, even by New Hampshire standards, $20 million is a lot of money. <laughs> I should say, even by Governor Romney's standards, $20 million is a lot of money. Um, and so that, that well, well, not really, but it's a round of for him, but still, you know. <laughs> And so, you know, Pat, that, that was a, a, a meeting that had never been reported on. In fact, many people didn't know the Governor Romney to this, you know, until we put it in the book, didn't even know the Governor Romney had ever taken out a line of credit for the campaign. Um, and so capturing a, the fact of that, you know, getting, telling me how these rather abashed senior aides had to explain to Governor Romney that this campaign was broke. Um, and then Governor Romney having to think through whether he really wanted to do that. Um, those are all... He was really the nominee. Yes. Right. So, so all of that, all of those various interpersonal dynamics and the historical nature, the historic nature of the meeting, those are all things we're trying to do, and trying to do it in a relatively economical way. Um, it's a challenge, but um, it's kind of what we live for when we're doing these books. Well, I think it really does give texture to it, Mark. I think it really, they will say to you, what did you eat? What kind of sandwiches did he have? Where did you get them? I mean, I, I, you've asked me those kind of questions, and I, I love to recite the menu. But we can't, uh, we can't confirm that we've ever interviewed you. <laughs> <laughs> I know that. Good, but it would be wrong. But, uh, are, are people willing to go into that kind of detail? And obviously, it must be. But uh, does that get credibility to what they're saying? Will they remember it with that kind of precision? Well. I mean, it does add credibility, and, and again, it also sets the scene. I'll give you an example of something that uh, that is pure color, and yet yeah, it's got an enormous amount of attention and people just delight in uh, in the book from early on, which is in Governor Romney's vice president's selection process, two of the young aides who worked on that, uh, you know, Beth Myers, who ran the process, wanted it walled off from the rest of the campaign because they wanted secrecy and avoid leaks. And so these two young aides who worked on the, the thing ate a lot of goldfish crackers. And so they named the vice presidential selection process Project Goldfish. And then they gave each of the five finalists uh, aquatic nicknames to refer to them so that it would be clear, in their view, who was being discussed. So it's like they called um, uh, um, uh, Senator Rubio Pescata. <laughs> in, in, in one of the code names that I don't think require the NSC, NSA to break, they call uh, Paul Ryan Fish Concert. Um, <laughs> and you're surprisingly lost. Yeah. The one that's got, the, the, one that's got the, the most attention and also maybe lacks total creativity was they called Governor Christie Pufferfish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's 
pure color. There's no, you know, there's nothing about that affected the outcome or anything. But that kind of color people like, and, and it, it is part of kind of the fabric of the campaign. But doesn't it make the, the stuff accessible to people? No. I mean, it, it drives the narrative. It, it's, yeah. it's buzzy. Yeah. It's more fun to read. Well, it's also, you know, it's just the, I mean, we, again, Mark talked before about our initial conversation now four years ago, almost four years ago, when we first talked about doing the first book, was, you know, we wanted to write the book like a novel, except everything that was true. And those are the kind of details that, you know, that, that make it, that just open the scene up to people. Because in truth, it, it does, it, it gets of no historic consequence, but it does make it very easy for people to imagine these two young aides sitting around, coming up with code names and looking at the package of goldfish crackers and saying, oh, hey, let's do that. That's something you can kind of, you know, that's relatable. The, uh Obviously, Game Change made Double Down possible. And, but Game Change was one of these unique open seat elections where the, the President Bush was retiring. We had an extraordinarily dramatic, historic race between the first really major female candidate, the first African American on the Democratic side, this cast of a thousand characters on the Republican side. Twelve was the story of a president going for the election. Describe the difference in those races and what it meant in terms of how you find the narrative. Well, you've got an incumbent, so so you've got to cover the president as both president and as well as a candidate for re-election. And so that was kind of a difficult choice for us to make, or at least I say difficult, but it's something to think through. The president is so well covered, even more than a campaign. The White House gets so much coverage, we have to decide what was important about his his time in office as it related to his re-election. And at the same time, the, the, so that only would leave us one, one nomination fight as opposed to two. At the same time, the, the stakes for the country and kind of the intensity of it and the, the, the perception that it would be a closer race than it was in 2008 added a lot to it. The energy of the Tea Party, uh, the real um, struggle for the president within the Democratic Party to, to, to energize a base that was discouraged by a lot of decisions he did make as president, and the kind of puzzle for the Republican Party with a front runner who had a lot of appeal to about 30% of the party, but a real ceiling on his support and the efforts of the, of the some people in the party, including a lot of the wealthiest people in the country, to get another candidate in the race, the, the frustration of the Tea Party and thinking about Mitt Romney as their nominee. And there's you know, if you looked at, if you did a focus group of political elites, of journalists and people in both parties in 2000, in December of 2010, and said, let's say Mitt Romney's the nominee of your party, what would he be like as a general election candidate? The things that they would have said at that time pretty much all came true. And, and that sort of slow motion, if you're part of the expression, uh, car wreck, um, <laughs> watching that, watching that play out, watching Governor Romney fight against what he knew would be some of his big challenges was a pretty compelling story up against, again, the story of an incumbent who has to find a way to defend his record, get reelected, and, and, and knowing that his chances of winning were smaller than they were the first time around. I'll say that the best two things about this, about this interview so far are watching you grimace whenever I comment about Governor Romney. It's, it's getting better, John. Yes, it's been no, six months ago. You have that, you have that you um, the other thing I'll say that's the biggest difference between these books, um, uh, between Game Change and Double Down, and they're obviously they're very similar, where mm -hmm. there's Mark said in terms of what we're trying to do. In terms of the, re the reception to the two books, um, the biggest difference so far has been that this book, um, unlike the first book, has been actually endorsed by uh, Kim Jong Un and the North Korean government. <laughs> You think, you, think that, you think I'm kidding, but it's true. Actually, about a week ago, I got this Google alert, and I looked at North Korea, this is strange, I looked up Washington Post story, headline in Washington Post, North Korea endorses double down as proof that, quote, the U.S. is the root cause of all sorts of evils. <laughs> and you know, that's the kind of thing you kind of dream of when you write it. That. That, goes, that goes right on the back of the paperback. <laughs> The names of the Kim Jong Un Book Club, which is the only, the only book club more powerful than the Oprah Book Club. Uh, it's a better reaction than Kim Jong Un's uncle got today. Okay. Uh, especially in the context of today, we're going to have to that in um, there's a, a part I found fascinating. If you're in one campaign, you always kind of imagine that you know what's going on in the other campaign. And most of us, if you've been around for a while, uh, you, you have friends and you talk to them. But there is a, a piece here, and I'm going to 
I want to get to a broader theme about where politics are headed. When you touch on it about, uh, I guess it's about a year out, and the president has these Saturday meetings. I don't know what people have read the book, but it's fairly early in the book. And this is a, a, a president who puts together politically, or has put together for him, a really remarkable campaign. Uh, you know, crushed us in terms of technology and other student electors. But there were moments when, even internally, they were concerned about where things were. And for those of you who haven't read it, those of you who have, go through that, that the Saturday meeting story, which is really, I think it's right at the beginning of the book. But what that shows you about, even inside a, 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 a pre president who's historic, and just by his being, uh, has to face as he looks at a re-election. Yeah. I'll set up the period and then I'll let John talk about uh, the, the two critical meetings. This is the fall of uh, 2011, uh, about a year before election day. Uh, and the president had come out of it, one of the, the big early fight he's had some since with the Republicans about debt and debt sit in the debt ceiling and tried to get a big deal with John Boehner and failed. And came out of that into the summer and then the early fall. Uh, being perceived as weak, that was kind of the word that was used, by not just Republicans in the press, but by a lot of Democrats. His approval rating was down um, to the mid to low 40s, um, you know, the darkest period of his presidency, although it now White House calls those the good old days. But at that point, it was the darkest period. And so a lot happens during that period. He, he decides, he does, the president does something he rarely does, he decides he needs the help of another human being, and that's Bill Clinton. So they begin the courtship of Bill Clinton. Uh, this is the period when, as some people have heard in the headlines from the book, uh, his top aides considered maybe swapping out, uh, replacing Joe Biden with Hillary Clinton on the ticket. And they began to have these uh, semi-regular meetings, uh, starting out with the big group, uh, with White House, as you do with an incumbent president, with a combination of White House officials, including the vice president initially, and, uh, and campaign officials to try to figure out how do we go forward. It was the president and his team were pretty, thought it was pretty likely that Mitt Romney would be the nominee. And the president felt pretty confident he could beat Mitt Romney. But if they looked at the polling data where he stood, approval rating, wrong track, all those things, uh, there was a fair amount of concern that um, winning re-election would not only be difficult, but some people around the president thought, that thought he was the underdog. Yeah, well, and the president also, I think, was going through a period of real searching um, of his own, just to, you know, uh, this, this period Mark just described him being called weak by both sides. He was kind of battered um, psychologically at that point. And so the, the two crucial meetings that we report about in the book, one is um, after he's been talking a little bit about, about, about the way in which he felt as though he'd been governing in too political and too pragmatic a way, not, not kind of being true to himself. And one of his aides, you know, says, well, "Why don't you, you know, maybe, maybe you should write down a list of issues on which you feel like you haven't been true to yourself and talk about those things." They thought the president would go off and write down a couple things on a on an index card, you know, and bring that back to the next meeting. Instead, he shows up at the next meeting with a stack of illegal pages, and on this this list, this long list, uh, is a series of things: immigration, uh, Guantanamo Bay, gay marriage. Um, poverty, race, a whole bunch of different things, climate, um, a lot of liberal things, basically, where his basic attitude was, you know, I feel like, I, he was saying, basically, I regret that I haven't done more on these issues. And for everybody in the room, um, it was kind of an incredible, extraordinary moment. It was like the President of the United States going through the regrets of his first three years in office, and they all listened to him talk about this in this very solemn, kind of thoughtful, searching way. And it wasn't like he was laying out an agenda for re-election. It was more, you know, maybe these were things they would do in the second term. Maybe they were things he would try to talk about differently during the campaign, but it was just this introspective um, moment. And it was like a therapy session, in some sense. Now, the President had been very uh, uh, concerned, while well, his people had been very concerned, about possibly leaks from these meetings. And so, in particular, there were a number of books that had come out in that fall. The President was upset about the books, and upset about the people in his White House were talking to book authors. And David Plouffe had said, you know, don't, we shouldn't have these meetings be so big. And Obama said, no, I trust my people. I'm going to have a larger group. But I'm going to tell them everything that happens in this room has to stay in this room. And that was particularly true of this meeting, which was this kind of, you know, very politically sensitive topic. So shortly thereafter, um, the things that were on that list were leaked to a couple of book authors who are here. Um, <laughs> Um, the, the next meeting, um, the President's, uh, David Plouffe, the senior advisor, and Jim Messina, his campaign manager, come in and said, you know, Hyman and Halpern have the list that you read at the last meeting. 
the president was very upset about that and went into the next meeting and, and, and really gave his group a talking to and said, you know, was very upset, very, very, felt very hurt, felt betrayed, um, told him he felt hurt, felt, told me he felt betrayed, and said, if, if nobody comes forward and admits that they're the source, I'm not gonna have these meetings anymore. And he stormed out of the room. Um, and then Vice President Biden spoke about four or five times as long as President Obama spoke, because President, that's by Joe Biden, of course. So he basically said the same thing as the president, only much longer. Um, and he stormed out of the room. Um, so you have now the first ever, as far as we know, the first ever POTUS, v POTUS, double walkout. <laughs> but the president, I'll, I'll say the code of this story is that the president walked out of the room very upset and angry at us and angry at his team and angry at book authors and angry at all those things. And then being the president, he had like a whole schedule. So he went and did a few other things. He had a wounded warriors thing and a couple other meetings. And then at two o'clock that afternoon, he went to the Oval Office and had to sit down with David Marinus for a book interview, uh, which is the ultimate indignity. <laughs> the, um, from, again, from the other side, did it ever seem to, at that point, that they could lose? Did they ever contemplate losing? The two periods where they seemed to be pretty concerned, one was the period we're just now talking about in the fall of 2011, where the president's numbers were bad. Uh, they were terribly afraid of the Republican super PACs. Uh, and, and particularly, they thought Crossroads, with Carl Rose Group, would start spending money much earlier than they did. So they're very worried about that. Uh, and then the other period we re I referenced earlier, on the eve of the second debate, where the president had a horrible performance in the first debate, he told everybody on Barack Obama, I don't lose two in a row, he would do well, but he had a series of very bad uh, practice sessions, including the de second debate was on a Tuesday night, Sunday night they were at debate camp in Williamsburg. Uh, and you know, they do, like, uh, like Romney can't, they did, they do mock debates where you have John Kerry standing in for Governor Romney, and they start right at nine o'clock, and it's a time thing, and the president was horrible. He was not only the way he was in Denver, in the first debate, being slow talking and using too much, too much Washington language, and and and, and not seeming very energized. But he also was occasionally kind of peevish, uh, which were the two sides they really were trying to avoid. And his aides then stayed up all night. Uh, they maybe got some of them got a little bit of sleep, but they, they stayed up all night trying to decide what to do. They had one more day of practice before the second debate. And David Plouffe said, uh, "I'll clean up what he said a little bit, but you'll get the point." He said, "We could lose this whole election." if the president performs the way he did last night in that, in that rehearsal or in the first debate. Their focus group showed them the voters were very forgiving of the president's bad performance in the first debate. He must have had something on his mind, you know, uh, anybody can have a bad night, but they were quite, quite strongly believed that if he had another bad performance, it would really change things up. So in that period from 10.30 Eastern time when he finished the practice and left, until the following morning when they did what they described as an intervention with the President of the United States and talked to him about, about why he was having so much trouble performing well in the debates, they thought they, thought they could lose at that point. Let me get back to the general in a minute, but let's take a couple of on the Republican side. Um, you sort of said how the White House viewed the field. You guys looking at the field out, I've been in this a long time, never seen such a train wreck. I mean, there was the Urban Cain League, there was the New Gingrich Month, there was the St. Dora Month. I mean, everybody sort of, there was Michelle Bachman, an hour and a half. <laughs> 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 we, we, we had, <laughs> one, one way of saying that is that it was so bad that it made Mitt Romney look good. No, I didn't say that. Did you ever see that kind of a, a, a process where so many people got their moment in the sun and you kept saying, when does this get real? I certainly the most, it was the most, um, it was A, the weakest deal in, in either party that we've ever seen in our time covering <coughs> presidential politics for a couple of decades each. And it was certainly the most volatile um, season from, if you, you know, from the summer of 2011 through to the end. You know, it was the most volatile uh, period, at the, the most volatile, vo volatile nomination contest either one of us ever seen. And you know, it really was, I think it spoke to something Mark mentioned earlier, which is, you know, and, and it's something, Tom, I know you agree with. You know, Governor Romney was sort of a man without a country. You know, he was not the candidate of the Tea Party and the, and the grassroots and the, the far right, nor was he really the candidate of the establishment. 
And the establishment, as we write about in the book in great detail, spent a lot of time trying to get somebody else to get in. That's um, what they call the white night period. Well, the white night period late, you know, as late as February of 2012, where, where senior people in the party are trying to get Paul Ryan to get in or, or get Chris Christie to get in. But if you think about it, all through the fall of 2011, there's an effort to get Chris Christie in. And there had been Mitch earlier, earlier Mitch Daniels, okay. um, Jeb Bush, uh, Haley, Haley Barber, and all of the above, right? So, you know, I haven't read the book. Let it read about Haley Barber. If those of you who know him, will, will, it's a very accurate portrayal of a really marvelous politician, but it's really worth the praise. Of it. So, if you add in, it's kind of like Game of Thrones with the Sopranos. That's how I pitched it to me. So, if you, if you add in, if you add in a period, you add in a nomination contest that has super PACs involved. So, there's individuals like Shell Donaldson who can spend a lot of money to keep Newt Gingrich afloat long after he should have sunk, um, long enough for him to go on a tour of the nation's zoos and get bitten by a penguin. <laughs> And you add, you add all that money and the unpredictability of the money. endorsed by the union leader at the same time. The unpredictability of the, that the money injected in the race, the nature of our media now, which has become more and more um, uh, nuts on some level, um, with the fact that you have a, a front runner who could never break through really much above 30%. So within the party, seeming vulnerable, it gave rise to this you know, kind of supernova phenomenon that saw a lot of these very unlikely characters have a moment, at least, where they streaked across That's the sky. Like, talking about processes, do you think the fact that the races all became proportional so that you never had a winner take all, so you never could get a knock? I mean, there was this sheer moment of total brilliance in Romney, which was the New Hampshire campaign. But after that, uh, you, you couldn't get him over where he sort of spread eagle the field. And there was like death by a thousand cuts because people were always being delegates of these things and you could never get to the knockout that occurred with Bush and, and he was the king. Well, as you know, there's a there's a mathematical knockout and then there's the momentum knockout. And and John was on some of this, but you had you had benefactors keeping Gingrich and Centaurum in the race with the super PACs. And you had in Centaurum and, and Gingrich two candidates who really felt that Governor Romney was illegitimate, that, that because he supported a health care law with an individual mandate, because of some of the issue position changes he made, that he was not worthy to be the Republican nominee. And so they just disinclined to get out of the race. In the case of, of uh, Speaker Gingrich, he knew it was the last time he'd ever run for president, given his age, and so it's hard to sort of give that up as easily. And in the case of, of Senator Santorum, you know, he was he was underfunded, even 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 with the help of the Foster Freeze, and, and I think he had you know chip on his shoulder, maybe a little bit too strong, but he certainly felt like he certainly didn't react well to the notion he should be pushed out of the race. And because of proportionality, and because Governor Romney lost some contests, he wasn't going to be in a majority. And so mathematically, uh, they kept waiting uh, to um, to. Uh, uh, for something to happen, you know, no one ever really took a clean shot at him. Quite remarkably, no one ever advertised extensively on health care. Uh, no one ever ran uh, a, a consistent, disciplined, anti-Romney message campaign. You know, Governor uh, uh, Senator Santorum and Speaker Gingrich have a lot of strengths as politicians, but neither of them is particularly disciplined about driving the same message repeatedly. And so, they sort of. They and their supporters kept or waiting for there to be a moment where Governor Romney would be confronted, and they thought he'd come down like a house of cards because they felt he was out of step with a lot of the party. I remember the night he could, I forget what it was, but we finally clinched. We gave out half to said the long slog, which is really what it, it felt like. But we, Romney finally wins, and we get this summer where we talk about the money shortage. We go to the convention then, the convention in Tampa, and I will posit for this discussion, it was probably the worst political convention I have ever been to. The, the banging was terrible. We had a hurricane for two days of it. We got shortened, and then there was Clint Eastwood. So, <laughs> <laughs> the convention. I'll say the hurricane was the high point. <laughs> In terms of getting the candidate's message out, um, yeah, look, I mean, it was you know, Governor Romney kept having these moments where he thought he would reset, you know, and and one of them was his foreign trip, which did not go well. One of them was the the vice presidential selection, which was which worked out okay for him, didn't hurt him, but didn't didn't, didn't check. Actually, it helped him at, at the moment. And uh, he felt very comfortable with right. Ryan. He so I think it was a real but, but it didn't but it didn't it didn't radically alter the dynamic. Right. Right. And, and he wasn't really shooting for that. But but none of those things. But the convention was going to be the moment where he really thought that he could. This was like a moment where he could really change things around. And as you said, you had the 
the, the first hurricane, which was the meteorological hurricane. Then you had the second hurricane, which was Governor Christie, who you know was the human hurricane, who came in and gave a, 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 a keynote speech that was not widely perceived as having been um, totally successful because to the ears of, and eyes of many, especially those around Governor Romney, he spent a lot of time talking about Governor Christie and about New Jersey and about Bruce Springsteen and about his mother, but not that much talking about Governor Romney, which, which they found slightly wanting. Um, and then you had, of course, the last night, which is you know the night of the, the Clint Eastwood speech, the Clint Eastwood debacle. And, and, you know, describe, what, describe how that played out. Well, you know, um, we were reported a book about this. It's one of the things we most took most delight in, in some ways, was, was because it's one of the, you know, in both of the books, you know, Mark and I often, we, there were these big public moments that happened in campaigns and, and were, were there's, our goal is, you know, these things happen, people are kind of struck by them, amazed by them, have a lot of questions about them, and then the circus moves on, and no one ever really explains whatever actually happened. So in this case, going back and teasing out what actually happened, how Clint Eastwood actually got there, how that all came about was a big thing for us, and it turns out it started, you know, really there are a lot of complicated reasons for why it was there, but ultimately it was about Mitt Romney being starstruck, meeting Clint Eastwood at a dinner in California about a month out from the convention, saying basically, you know, hey, that's great, this is neat, Clint Eastwood, you know, we're finally a Hollywood star who likes Republicans, um, and say, let's get him to come. And they got him to come, and, and Eastwood really didn't have any idea what he was going to say. And it's hard to tell a Hollywood star, you got to read a script, or you got to read a teleprompter. And um, maybe some around Governor Romney should have had the fortitude to do that, because by the time he got to Tampa, he still didn't really know what he was going to say. And they tried to get him to sort of say, well, you'll talk, you'll do the speech that's like one you gave at a fundraiser a little while ago, and Eastwood kept blowing them off. Um, and then he goes up to his hotel room, um, where he's waiting a couple hours before his speech, and he's sitting around in the hotel room, and he's um, uh, listening to the radio, oldie station, and he hears Neil Diamond's song, I Am I Set, which has a line in it about uh, no one heard at all, not even the chip. And he thinks, well, that's kind of a weird line. I like Neil Diamond, but that line makes no sense. But he goes to the convention hall then, and then he's sitting back there listening to all of these people giving testimonials to Romney. And he's saying to himself, you know, everybody's talking about great men Romney is. I don't want to be like everyone else. I don't want to talk about great men Romney is. I want to do something else. And at that moment, the idea of the chair from the lyric appears in his head, or re recurs in his head. He thought he had to reach the camera. Thank God. <laughs> and he's like, literally just a couple minutes before they're about to go out on stage, no one had any idea. He says to a stage hand, hey, do uh, you have a chair around here anywhere? And the stage hand says, well, do you want this one with the back or this one without the back? He says, well, I'll take one with the back. And they put it out there on stage, and he goes out and does what everybody saw him do, which was you know, this rambling, weird, da-da dinner theater thing um, that was kind of crazy and went on way too long. It was profane and everything else. And as all that's happening, the Romney campaign has exploded uh, behind the scenes with, <laughs> with, with, with uh, iPhones. The chief, the chief strategist is throwing up backstage. Uh, Governor Romney is um, perplexed uh, backstage. Um, the iPhones are blowing up. And all for good reason, which is that you know this was the last moment of the campaign that the Romney campaign had totally under its control. Mitt Romney was about to get this biggest speech of his political life, and rather than people being focused on that, they were now focused on this doddering old man talking to an empty chair. But it, 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 the other piece of that, 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 that Rubio was going to come out, and Rubio had a very powerful speech to give, but they had to compress it because of the time to Eastwood. I mean, it, 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 it's hard for people who sit back over the years and say, well, that's ridiculous, how could that happen? But I think part of the, uh, the intrigue and part of the, what you learn from a book like this is things, the bumper stickers are right, stuff happens. And uh, it, it happens. It's right. <laughs> <laughs> so go out and then you know while we get that one. <laughs> so let's go back to the campaign now. So we come out. Uh, the, the number usually was six, seven points, four points, back and forth. Uh, let's talk about that first debate. I will tell you, we did an event which was a very low point in the campaign before, and I forget what had happened. Uh, and we did an event here in Manchester. We decided we needed to pull our troops together. So we brought about 35 people and, and, and into a, a, a restaurant in Manchester with a TV set, and it was a pretty disconsolate group, and I had to uh, give the rally the troops thing. But then the debate started, and things got better and better. And all of a sudden, we had 200 people in the room, and people are screaming and yelling. And I actually thought that was a pretty good night for him. 
field. How did they read you? Know, the, I mean, where? Well, you know, going into the debate, uh, you know, and we do a fair amount of writing and report, reporting and writing on this. Governor Romney had a horrible September leading up to the debates. He had the 47, he had the, 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 the mishandling of the Benghazi, the tragedy in Benghazi, and then the 47 percent video. And um, uh, shortly before the first debate, convenes his campaign convenes a, a secret meeting in. Um, in Boston, where they bring in people, political Republican leaders from around the country to kind of give Governor Romney advice. Uh, there were about nine Republican officials there. You'll be disappointed here that only two, uh, Governor Sununu and Kelly Ayotte, were from New Hampshire. So I know you all would expect there'd be more from New Hampshire than nine, <laughs> only two. Uh, but but they they give him advice, and he's he's not very engaged in the sense that. If you think about the way a Bill Clinton or Barack Obama or George Bush might have handled a similar crisis, he basically said, I'm just going to go into the debate and do well there, and that's going to change things around. And it did. He was extraordinarily well prepared, thanks to his team doing a good job preparing him, thanks to Senator Portman, who not only stood in playing the president, but also was a debate advisor and, and gets high marks for him really for that. Uh, but also because Governor Romney is very task oriented. When he faces a crisis, instead of maybe often instead of dealing with the crisis head on, he'll find another task that it kind of will work in a longer range way to fix it. And he was very well prepared. The president was very confident about the debates early on. His team started quite early, uh, but they were kind of a little bit confused about what their strategy should be. They didn't want the president to be too aggressive. They thought that that, that, that might yield a, a negative side. They, they didn't want to hear a reprise of. Uh, the famous New Hampshire debate line, you're like pulling up Hillary. And so they, they made it kind of, right here. Yes. They overcoached him a little bit. And um, and the president went from confident, told his team early on in their first debate meetings, if you get me to the debates tied, I'll win this election in the debates. Uh, they briefed him and said, Mr. President, early on, the first briefing they had, they said, incumbents never win the first debate. The challenger benefits from being on the stage. The president's out of practice. The challenger's been nomination debates all along the way. They said, you'll never win. And he said he would. When they got to the eve of the debate, he was kind of psyched out and said to them, I can't win this debate. There's no way I can win. The press wants Governor Romney to win this. All of that contributed to Governor Romney having a great performance. There's some things we report in the book about the logistics of how the president was managed. They, his debate camp at, in uh, near Las Vegas was a disaster. They got him to Denver the day of the debate rather than the night before, which is what Governor Romney did. His dinner was late. He wanted to call his daughters right before he left for the debate venue. And amazingly, the president of the United States could not find a phone that worked to call his daughters. That rattled them a little bit. And so when he gets to the debate itself, He's not particularly prepared. He's a little bit psyched out. Governor Romney is in a great place. Uh, right before the debate, to just show you how relaxed he was, um, he was they were talking about what he should wear, what tie he should wear. And he said, maybe maybe I won't wear a tie at all. I'll just go with the Ahmed Jinnajad look. <laughs> um, so he was very relaxed. Uh, backstage, he was playing with his grandkids right before the debate. And, and you saw the result coming out of that. Um, you know, just absolute jubilation, not just here and not just on the debate side, but around the country. You saw lots of Republicans at the elite level and down below for the first time thinking that, that, that the race could be won. As I said, not very much panic in the, amongst the president and his inner circle, really none at all. Lots of rank and file Democratic panic until they got to the debate camp in Williamsburg, as I've already mentioned, where their panic after his poor performance in the practice session escalated up privately and secretly until our book, but escalated up sky high. One of the many reasons to read the book, or both books, is that you get an understanding that this incredible drama that plays out in television is about real people. They have kids, they have families, they forget to pay the insurance bill, their phones don't work, uh, all kinds of things happen. These are real people who put them in these enormously difficult circumstances. And one of the things that kept me involved as long as I have is, is this, there is a humanity part of this process. And, and these people all who run, uh, this is my little plug here, gen generally and genuinely believe in this country. And you've you got to give them credit for it. Uh, quickly here before I get to questions, um, I thought that a very telling point beyond all the sort of technical stuff was how well the Obama people understood the electorate, who was going to vote, how badly we understood the electorate. We had a model, we kept saying, well, they can't possibly turn people out like in 2008, and, and we were right, they turned out poor and turned out 2008. Uh, and it, it was brilliant. Did, did, did you ever feel, knowing the access you had to data, and we all have a lot of access to each other's data, about 
that they understood it better and, that, that, and, and we just didn't get it? I, I always thought that, and, and you know, the, the, there was there was a there were, this was a story of parallel universes, right, in this election, where you had and there always are. Yeah, but in this case, you know, there was a there was a Republican universe of data, and there was a Democratic universe, and a, and, and all of the rest of the public polling. It wasn't like there, there were there were just there were just two sides here. You had all the public polling, you had the president's internal polling, all showing one all based on the notion of a presidential electorate that looked more like 2008 than than it looked like 2010, and that each successive presidential electorate looked more <coughs> higher degrees of minority participation, young people, the ascendant coalition the president tapped into, that you could see that going back 20 years, that, that the, the white voting share was gonna drop, et cetera, et cetera. And you looked at the Republicans who were, who were at Romney running either ahead or neck and neck with the president, and you realized that they were all basing their assumptions on <coughs> A much much wider midterm electorate right. than, than, than general than a, than a presidential electorate, and you know, uh, it, 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 it is it's, it's not. I think there was a bubble of delusion on, on one side of the Republican that, that governed the republic the, the Republicans writ large, not just Governor Romney's campaign, but in total. Um, but there's also the fact of, and this is something that I think you know, is easily overlooked, but it's really a basic thing. You know, if you if you give smart people three years and a billion dollars. You know, they are going to understand the electorate better than the group that is scrambling for cash, has to fight for a nomination, it is broke in May or June or July of the election year. You know, they're gonna, that, that group with a billion dollars and no competition, with all that time, all that money, all those smarts focused on 10 states or eight states or nine states, um, they're gonna understand that electorate better and they're gonna have a better machine and operation in place to get those people out. Now that doesn't excuse Governor Romney's team's failings, but it does tell you that the Obama campaign is one of the great advantages of incumbency, and one of the reasons why, if you can keep from getting yourself in a primary fight if you're an incumbent, why you have such an advantage, because you have the advantage of time and money to really focus on exactly, the, the president's team wasn't just focused on states, they were focused on, not even just on blocks or individual, they were focused on individual voters, and they had time for years to be focused on those individual voters and getting those people to the polls, persuading them, something that Governor Romney's team or any challenge would never have been able to have. That, that's true. A couple of final points on that. It, we've seen now here in the last two presidents um, both sort of reach their political zenith uh, in their re-election. I mean, Bush takes a narrow, narrow, incredibly narrow win, wins very comfortably the second time through electoral college. Same thing with, with Obama goes from a, a, a very tough general election, uh, uh, nomination fight, wins comfortably, and then gets re-elected against a lot of odds. It, it seems to me that the political task of getting the nomination is very different than the task of governing. And what drives the first term of a lot of presidents is to perfect the political task to get to the second term. And then we get into the second term, and I'm not being partisan, right? I think we see it. It, it stripped of another political milestone, i.e. re-election. The governing becomes very hard, and we almost immediately start, who's gonna come next? Am I right, or do you see a similar thing about why the second term seemed to be so difficult? Well, I mean, President Reagan's second term was difficult. I, I thought right. a brand new phenomenon. I think that but he had he had a really good contract. Yeah. Up the well, but but again, I mean, if you look at the modern second terms, you know, s scandals tend to come right. up and, right. and and festering problems, and and obviously being a lame duck, which you are, you know, by definition, the minute you get reelected, does remove certain advantages. I think we're in a very tough time now as a country in terms of the partisanship, which the last three presidents, all two termers, have you know talked about trying to get rid of and, and haven't been able to at all. And uh, the media culture is very tough, and uh, um, and uh, uh, the um, nature of the incentives of actors in Congress have, have created uh, it made the situation more difficult for presidents to govern by. 
and having people fear them or love them or see them as inspirational. And again, I have incredible respect for the last three presidents. And, and, and if you took their resumes and their inclinations, you would have said all of them would have had a great chance to succeed in changing the culture of Washington, which would have allowed them to govern more successfully in their second term. But it just, it's very tough, and they all failed. And I think as a country, we have to ask ourselves, do we want presidents who can have two successful terms? And if we do, are we willing, no matter how partisan we might be in any individual instance, are we willing to support the kind of changes that would make that more likely? Now, President Clinton would say that he had a pretty good thing. He did. And so, and that's not that long ago. So, it, 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 it's, it's, he's a special guy, and you know, his political gifts, I think, it is not controversial to say that he's got greater political gifts than his two successors. But we can't count on uh, more Bill Clintons uh, necessarily to, to have the kind of And each of the successors had enough skills to win two Plenty of skills to win two terms. But it's, it just, we're just in a very tough, divided period as a country now. and. Um, uh, you know, you, you think about how difficult the, the budget agreement this week notwithstanding, you think how difficult it is to do the kinds of things that, um, that uh, uh, take support from the other party and, and, uh, and you know, we take a very strong president to do that in the second term. I will say, I've said this many times before, I think President Obama's failure to get Republican support for health care will go down almost without question as the biggest mistake of his presidency. And I think, I think most of the problems, or a lot of the problems of this term, date to that decision and if this didn't have effects that that had. The um, 2016, will it be a game change three? <laughs> Stay tuned. Okay. <laughs> Can you give us a very quick. It's going to be called Game Change 3 The Rise of Wrath. <laughs> Wrath of wrath. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh, I'm, I'm not sleeping. Um, the, give us a quick look really fast at that race because it all is going to be decided here. Well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure what else to say about it in that time. Um, well, I, th I think that uh, on the Democratic side, um, if uh, Secretary Senator uh, Clinton um, decides to run, and Mark and I, I think both are of the view that she's quite likely to run, but not certain, that's not 100% certainty, um, given her health, given her husband's health, given the possibility that she may simply stare down the barrel of uh, what it would mean if she ran and won, as Haley Barber, right. frankly, did, which is, you know, you have to look at it like a 10-year commitment. You're running for two years, you get elected, you get re-elected, you know, that's the rest of her, like, work, the rest of her, of, 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 her effective professional life, mm -hmm. takes her to almost the age of 80, you know, will she, does she really want to do that? She may decide she doesn't, but at the moment, I think the likelihood is she'll run, and if she runs, I think the likelihood that she'll win the Democratic nomination is extraordinarily high, and not merely because she's Hillary Clinton and she's, a, you know, a, a celebrity, et cetera, et cetera. You think about, you drill down into what makes up the Democratic nominating electorate, and you think about um, those groups, women, uh, African Americans, Latinos, gay and lesbians, um, union households, she has extraordinary power among all of those constituencies. And on top of that, a g general broad based feeling within the party, male and female alike, that having nominated and then elected president of the first African American on the Democratic side, that it's time for a woman. And I think a lot of people feel that in the Democratic Party in a powerful, powerful way. And if it's going to be a woman, she's the woman. So I think she would be very hard to stop. If you add all that together, by the way, the Walter with, with her unparalleled fundraising ability, I just don't see who could stop her. And the fact that she looks unstoppable means that I think no one really try to stop her. She, you know, most of she becomes a Republican. It's her turn. Well, a bit, yeah. There's a lot of that, and I think you know, you think about someone like Joe Biden, you know, and, and other potential Democrats who might run. Most of them understand the adage that only fools stand in the way of honor coming trains. And she looks like a locomotive. Very yeah. So I think she'd be the Democratic nominee. The Republican side, I think, would be much, much more wide open. Um, there's a, there's a, it, it, it could be as, as wide open and fractious a nomination contest as the one in 2012, only I think with much more substantial figures in it, conceivably a much bigger cast of substantial figures. You know, there are a bunch of people in that category. Governor Christie is someone who's an A-list candidate. And Paul Ryan runs, he's an A-list candidate. Uh, but Jeb Bush runs, he's an A-list candidate. Those three for sure. And then you've got other candidates of considerable stature 
um, governors, you know, people who people don't mention as obviously, but it's got a guy like Scott Walker or a guy like Bobby Jindal, who would have to be taken seriously. I don't think they're A-level candidates, but they're real people who run states and, and would have a real following. You've got people in the Senate who command um, a much narrower slice, who command a relatively narrow slice of the Republican electorate, but someone like Ted Cruz would be a factor if he ran. Someone like Rand Paul would be a factor. I don't think likely nominees in the party, but people who would be real factors because of their strength with certain small but influential segments of the Republican electorate. You know, the question will be in the end whether anybody, who the person is, who can fuse establishment electability and respectability of the donor class's concerns and meet those concerns with someone who can also appeal enough to the Tea Party grassroots part of the party, and I think that's still an open question. There's a bunch of people, though, if, who could throw themselves in and make for a very, very, very interesting race. Quickly, um, Game Change, the movie. Uh, you say, did you read Game Change? You'll talk a lot about how they took the Sarah Palin piece out and made that this court. Double Down, the movie. <clears throat> What part will they lift out? We're not, because of our deal with HBO, we're not allowed to say any specificity to the day. The working title is page 89. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they've, opt they've opted it. We started having conversations with them, but no, there's no, really no decision. And, and uh, you know, the Palin thing was not the original right. first choice. It was going to be a lot of So we'll see. But there's, I, I, do you probably, I do understand that Tom Cruise is much shorter than he appears. I will, I will say that you know one of our favorite parts of the book um, is a portion of the book that relates to President Clinton um, offering in, in the, the fall of 2012. President Clinton has become much closer to Barack Obama. There's a whole story there. We can talk about that Q and A if you want. But there's a moment in September of 2012 where President Obama seems to he's, he's after the Republican convention, his lead has grown. The 47 percent of has come out comes out. It looks like you know, President Obama's on his way to skating to victory. And a friend of President Clinton's asked him, you know, what he thought of Governor Romney. And President Clinton said, you know, he's a very nice man who's in the wrong line of work. And he shouldn't be speaking to people in public, which is his assessment of Romney. When he's asked by a friend what his assessment of Barack Obama is, he reflects on Obama's good fortune. And he says he's, in classic Bill Clinton fashion, he says he's luckier than a dog with two dicks. <laughs> I have spent a long time now trying to figure out what's so big, what's so lucky about being a two-dick dog. <laughs> Apparently, in President Clinton's mind, that is the luckiest thing to do. <laughs> it, has, it, has, it has occurred to us, however, that when it comes to the movie. I want to see that movie. <laughs> that's, that's the biggest casting challenge to be <laughs> That's your big dog. You get to the end of these things, and you're, a lot of people in this room have done it, and you, you're exhausted, and you're tired, and you never want to do it again, ever, ever. You know about a presidential campaign or this event? Well, <laughs> but the president, you know, and then you sit down, and I did a while back, and you spent a couple of days, and you get to read this, and you remember what you, what you did, and how alive you felt, and how important it was, and, and it makes you want to do it again. So I want to thank you both for giving us a book that reminds us of why we do this. We appreciate it. Some questions. And we'd be really happy to take questions about whatever you want. Nothing's off limits. You can ask about it. politics or journalism, whatever you want. Go ahead and we will take only questions in the form of true false. <laughs> Go to the mics. Go to the mics. Whatever you like. So I, I was a part of the Obama legal effort in Florida, and to most Democrats in Florida, the idea they would schedule a convention in August struck as stupidity given our history of hurricanes. Things. But uh, the question I've got um, stems from the night in Tampa that we had the celebration in Florida. I drove to the celebration after working and the radio said we carried Hillsborough by a larger margin in 12 than we had in 08. <clears throat> and it's really directed at your understanding. Do the Republicans understand that the, the voter stuff that they're doing is actually backfiring horribly in the communities that they're targeting? Because I gotta tell you, in the Hispanic community, it was taken as an, an insult when I worked there. Do they realize it's backfiring? And it's sort of their entire message to that group. 
I mean, I think it's certainly of a piece of what has been an abject failure since Election Day to change the way they're dealing with uh, the groups that power the president's re-election, including Hispanics. Uh, you know, they've made no progress, uh, no discernible progress, even though it is a mathematical uh, uh, fact that they must be better than Hispanic voters, not just in the future, but in every election we're going to have if they're going to have a hope not just being a majority party, but an, instinct, an, an, an existing party. So I think, um, I think that um, uh, there are real passionate debates in the country. I'm just going to focus now on the last about not the over, overall view of their image, but on, on issues of ballot integrity and on um, and voter suppression. Yes, uh, set yeah. aside whether or not it's a good argument or a bad argument yeah. for a second. Yeah. The practical political effect yeah. in there, Florida is that's the defining issue in the Hispanic community. Well, that and, that and immigration are both pretty big. I, I actually <laughs> got the impression in 12 that it was actually this perception that they're trying to drive down. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's one of the many issues on which the Republican Party is torn between the energies and passions of the base vote and Fox News and talk radio and what they think is right and good policy and what would broaden their appeal to uh, ascending coalitions and groups. So I think it's, they've made no progress on figuring it out. And if you look at the actions at the state level since the election, uh, it would seem that, that they're, they're not shifting direction in a way that balances what any sophisticated party and party leaders have to do, which is uh, keep the base happy, but also appeal to, to new groups. And, and they've not done that so far at all. Hello, John Rist, uh, the former principal at Central High School, page 242. Um, <laughs> my, my question, I have a couple questions. Uh, number one, about the process of two people writing a book. Uh, how do you divvy up the duty? Do you argue about the approach you're going to take and how you're going to set the scene? Tell us about one big argument you had. And the other one, uh, the other question deals with what was the most outstanding line that you guys talked about and said, this is just so unbelievable, I can't believe it, like binders full of women, or, you know, uh, Clint Eastwood with the empty chair. What was the one thing that just, you just roared, laughed out loud? What do you think the percent chance that the answer doesn't involve a dog? <laughs> those, those are my two questions. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Carolyn showed up, TV 13. Oh, excuse me. Jack Looney? Yeah, sure. Um, so, um, most people are surprised to learn that Mark and I do um, do all of the, almost all of the interviews we do for the book together. Um, people assume that one of the advantages of being two is that we can split up duties and one person interviews one side, one person interviews the other side. Um, we don't really do that. We found over the course of these two books that um, if we, if we split up and, and interview um, people, we might go a little faster, but then we both have to read transcripts of each other's interviews and it would take that much longer. And it's really important for us, although you know, we, it takes us a year to get these books out after election day, we're moving pretty fast. Um, it, it's pretty important for us to know as we're going through the reporting process during, while the campaign's taking place and then especially afterwards, we need to know in real time what's important, where we're headed, what we're throwing off the sled, what we're focusing on. And so doing the interviews together um, keeps us in sync. And it also, um, it, it, it also helps in the actual interviews themselves. You know, one of us will be, you know, going along through an outline and it's good to have someone who's got your back if you forget something or you miss that someone just said something that's interesting or it's fruitful to pursue a, a, an orthogonal path. You know, the other person can chime in. So we actually get a lot out of doing the interviews together um, rather than doing them separately. Um, you know, we compile all these interviews, we get them all transcribed. Um, we get these massive, you know, for this last book, having done um, more than 500 interviews with more than 400 people, we had something like 30,000 pages of transcripts. Um, that's a lot to read. Um, they need to be read, they need to be annotated, they need to be broken down and built into outlines or the chapters. And then once we've got all that done, everything's out on page and we've got the outlines really broken down. We know exactly what wants, what needs to be written. We then hand over all the documents to our wives and let them write the book. <laughs> Fight. And the biggest fight we had, there was this time in Los Angeles where I was adamant 
I'm just adamant about Mexican food, and Mark was adamant about sushi, and we almost came to blows. <laughs> That's really the only fight I think we've ever had. We don't really disagree. We, we see we see the sort of task and the story uh, the same way, so we really don't have fights about process or what you're going to book or not. Carol? Carol Lynch, of TV 13. We, we see a uh, ever large uh, independent vote in elections, uh, and since I've been covering them anyway in the past 20, 20 plus years, I'm 55, my daughters are in their 20. Do you think in, in my lifetime or in my daughter's lifetime we'll actually see more than a two-party sy system in this country, and might it be an offshoot of this independent vote voter? I don't see it anytime soon. There's just a lot of institutional forces and factors at the state level and the federal level that reinforce the two-party system and the incentive of the politicians, all of whom are in the two parties, is to reinforce those. Uh, there are more independents, and both major parties struggle to figure out how to keep their brand alive. But I think it would take a really wealthy, really charismatic person who was determined to change the country to get elected as an independent and then try to build an independent movement up against just huge forces. So I think for the foreseeable future, we're not going to have an additional party and we're not going to have uh, a lot of independents run and win. Uh, we're just going to have the two parties struggling more and more to keep people engaged and to try to recruit people to be part of uh, the existing <coughs> parties. Uh, you know, part of the problem is we have two centrist parties in this country for all the back and forth and name calling, unlike the other industrialized democracies that have multiple parties and therefore extreme right, extreme left parties. We've got two pretty centrist parties. They're more polarized than they've been in our lifetime, but they're still both pretty centrist. One, one more, you, is that okay? Couple yeah, more. Neil <laughs> has informed me that this was the last question, I guess, so lucky me. Uh, <laughs> my name is uh, Jake Wagner. Um, I went to St. Anselm, and I'm the current chairman of the College of Republicans here in New Hampshire. Uh, before that, though, I was an intern on John Huntsman's campaign in New Hampshire from, like, literal start to finish. Um, before the event tonight, I was skimming through, and I didn't get a chance to read the whole book yet, but I was, um, I don't know if pleased is the appropriate word, but I was happy to see that you actually put in how uh, they were delayed on their plane, and they almost got on the wrong flight, and I just have vivid memories of sweating to death in Exeter Town Hall, waiting 45 you know, minutes to an hour, uh, you know, he was behind schedule, of course, but uh, I was just hoping you could reflect on Huntsman and his New Hampshire campaign, since it was so New Hampshire-centered. Um, and why his promise ultimately just didn't build up into uh, what a lot of people thought it could be. Um, well, you know, it's a strange, what, we wrote, we devote a whole chapter of the book to Huntsman, um, and it, it, it kind of, partly because the campaign and the candidacy was so, were so strange. Um, you know, and, I, and I mean that in a non kind of pejorative way, but it was an odd, Venture, you know, a guy who had been a pretty conservative governor of Utah, um, who then, um, while thinking about running for president in 2012, accepted the ambassadorship of Barack Obama uh, to China, left the country, pretty much left behind any sense that anybody in the Republican Party thought had that they thought he would come back and run in 2012, ran essentially a shadow campaign from Beijing um, with a bunch of hired guns on the Republican side who were kind of dreaming of a campaign for him that he was pretty detached from since he was 8,000 miles away. Um, they had a bunch of expectations of what he would be like when he came back. Um, I mean, like as both as a candidate, as a performer, as a source of money, uh, ability to self-fund the campaign. A lot of uh, very ambitious uh, expectations on the part of the people who were setting up the shadow campaign for him. When he came back, he turned out to be none of those things. He didn't have as much money as they thought. He wasn't willing to spend what money he had. The money that his father wanted to spend, he didn't want his father to spend on his behalf. So the campaign was immediately, as soon as he got back, um, struck, and he was also nothing like the political performer that his staff, the, the consultants and other staff people thought he would be. So he came back and had, as we wrote the book, as we write the book, he had an extraordinary, there was an extraordinary enthusiasm for him when he came back, and a lot of expect, expectation and anticipation on the part of a lot of people in the press. Sure, he heard Joe devoted the entire year to it. There was a lot, he was the morning Joe candidate for sure, for a little while. Um, but he came back and it turned out that A, that he didn't have, he was not willing to be as conservative as, as or present himself as, as much of a conservative as he would, as, as he would have needed to, to be competitive as conservative as his staff thought he was and was willing to present himself as. 
and that all of the hopes that they had for a well-funded campaign, and that was so crucial, was if he was going to come back as late as he came back and be plausible, he would need to be immediately well-funded right out of the gate to be able to take on Mitt Romney. The fact that there was no money there, the fact that the campaign was essentially in a state of financial crisis within six weeks of when he came back to the United States meant that although he got great press for about a month, the campaign was falling apart internally. And by the time, just to answer your question directly at the end of my sort of long answer, by the time it became a New Hampshire campaign, the campaign was doomed in the sense that he had essentially failed to break through uh, among the national press. He was still not raising any money. And he essentially made, rather than having made a, an affirmative strategic decision from the outset to focus on New Hampshire, he essentially decided to focus here because there was nowhere else for him to turn. He didn't have enough money to fight in any other state but one. And this was the only state that he thought that, it, that he or any people around him thought he had even a slight chance in. So this was kind of a desperation move rather than a, an affirmative premeditated, well thought out strategy from the outset. Um, the whole thing was really pretty much a mess from the get go. Um, he is an attractive guy in some respects, but um, he's, he, he has issues of political identity that he still has not worked out, I don't think, um, sufficiently to make him a credible major party competitor. If he wants to run for the Republican nomination again, it's an odd thing <coughs> to see him uh, building his brand around the notion of no labels and, and, and things that he's been doing. Again, those are fine things to do. But they're not things that are going to make him more competitive for the Republican nomination in 2016, if that's, if that's what he wants to do. Thank you. Neil, we would. We all set? Reggie? Thank you all very much. Thank you. So on behalf of the New Hampshire Institute of Politics at St. Anselm College, we want to...